We're going live and it says we're live. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Grad Chat from PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Fei Lin, and I'm a PhD candidate in biochemistry at UCLA. If you like what you see here, check out the PhD Balance YouTube channel for more grad chats, and don't forget to subscribe for notifications about when we go live. So our topic today is navigating legal status during grad school, and I'm excited to welcome our guest, Samira Nayak. Samira is a PhD candidate in population health in the Bouvet College of Health Sciences, and a graduate researcher at the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research at Northeastern University. She has a background in clinical psychology and she's a proud alumna of UCLA woo, woo. and Columbia University. So her research is in social epidemiology, more specifically in the social and political determinants of health and health equities. And Samir first came to the US in 2010 as an international student from India and has spent the last decade navigating the complicated U.S. immigration system. So welcome, Samira. How are you doing today? So good to be here. Definitely a little nervous, but um, thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I am so excited to talk to you because this is an especially important topic nowadays to touch upon and for everyone who is not directly impacted about this to educate themselves and get a sense of some of the challenges that are happening with legal status and when we're talking about international students the international student experience so one of the first questions that we have here is what does it mean to maintain legal status during grad school what makes this challenging for international students yeah, so I think um, when I think of legal status for international students, especially, it's the idea that when you come into the country on a student visa, and that's the perspective that I bring, um, it has a lot of restrictions. And when I first came here, I didn't realize that there were so many restrictions. So, you know, one of the first things is that you can only work on campus. So you can only have campus jobs. Um, you can only work 20 hours a week. Um, and so I know for many students, it can be taxing because you're limited in the types of jobs you can have to support yourself. You're limited in um, the amount you can work and you might, even not, you might not even know you're doing something that's a violation of your status. So even volunteering <laughs> outside of campus, even if you're not getting paid sometimes could be counted as work. And so you might end up violating your status. So there's a lot of rules and regulations that you have to learn. Um, and I think the immigration system is very intimidating. I'm still intimidated and it's been almost 11 years. Um, and so when you first come here, you're like very stressed or at least I was very stressed that I was doing something um, that would be a violation of my status. Right, and from the conversations that I've had with people who go through this, it just sounds like there's so much extra work involved on top of dealing with if it's you know moving or all of these it's just this so many other logistics to deal with on top of grad school on top of everything else that maybe people who aren't it have the, who don't have the international student status don't have to deal with and it's especially frustrating in that way and one of the next questions we have says, what are some common misconceptions about the U.S. immigration system, uh, especially as they pertain to students? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest misconception is that it's simple um, and that there's clear paths to residency and citizenship for everyone. So I remember it was my senior year of college and a, like a good friend was like, so are you a citizen yet? And I thought they were joking because I was like, no, you know, there's no path to residency and citizenship for students. So I think that's like one of the big ones is people don't realize that if you come in on like an F1 visa, which is, which is typical, um, you can't just change into a green card and then citizenship. Um, the only way to do that through your work is to then switch to having an employer sponsor you. And I kind of talked about this on our, my IG takeover yesterday. Um, 
And so I think for a lot of people, that's like, so I came here, I studied, I got my, you put out a work permit after you graduate called OBT. I got that and now I have to find an employer to sponsor me or I have to leave. The exception is if you're related, like a close relative of a US citizen or permanent resident. So for example, I'm married to a US citizen, which is how my status is able to change. Um, but that's like one of the big misconceptions that you come here as a student and then you can stay. Um, and a lot, I don't wanna say most, cause I don't know if that's true, but a lot of students actually cannot stay because we don't have that sort of direct path. And similarly, you know, you hear common rhetoric for people who aren't undocumented, like, why don't you just, I wanna put this in quotes so people know it's not me saying that, but like, why don't you just come the right way? Why don't you just like, you know, go to the border, go to a checkpoint and ask to be let in. And it's like, for a lot of people, there's no clear legal path that is affordable and accessible. So, you know, a lot of people who are undocumented, that was the only way they could come. Or if they came in like on a student visa and they overstayed their visa, it's because there was no sort of other option to continue their legal status. So I think that's kind of a big one. Um, but I think it's changing. I think perceptions are changing. You know, people are more exposed um, to a, a sort of varied images of what immigrants do and what they look like and, you know, the experiences that they bring. And so I think that's, that's good. And people are learning, which is always good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it just goes to the theme of listening to everyone's story and not going to if it's stereotypes or assumptions and I, I also really like this question because I, I think oftentimes people have these misconceptions because they don't take the time to stop and listen and if you it's not your lived experience it's it's just right. easy to just go straight to misconceptions and assumption yeah, and I think it's also, you know, we think in binaries, right? So it's like, you're a citizen or you're not a citizen. You're a, a good immigrant or the, the good immigrant, you know, stereotype or whatever, and the bad one. Um, and that's not at all true, right? There's like a whole spectrum between being undocumented and being a citizen. There's like all these different statuses you can have. You can go in and out of status. It's like, it's a mess. Um, and I forgot my train of thought, <laughs> but the idea, I think I was, the point I was trying to make is that there's a whole spectrum um, and it's easy in the, like to get caught up in just like one or the other. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot more. Yeah. I think overarching message is that it's, it's a spectrum. It's complicated approach everyone with compassion and be open-minded about their specific story, especially if this isn't an experience that, you know, that you have lived experience in. Right. So I, I love that overarching theme. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> right. And then, so this is also something that's especially relevant given the very intense political climate that we've been going through. And this next question said here says, how does immigration impact mental health? Did that change for you during the Trump administration? Yeah, so I think, and I, you know, I don't wanna, I just wanna clarify, I'm not like speak the representative of all immigrants, right? So like you said, everyone has their own experience, but from my experience and sort of anecdotally from people I know, I think there's always this stress, right? So if you're not a naturalized citizen, um, so if you come here and you're still in some sort of other category, there's always this like stress about like, what if something happens? What if I lose my job that that was my that, that was sponsoring me? Now I'll be deported. What if I'm on, you know, undocumented people, communities often have you know, huge levels of stress. It's like, I don't want to go outside and drive because you know, I, I saw a cop car, I'm using health services less. Um, so there's this like uncertainty and there's a stress and, you know, being, I was in, came in in 2010. So during the Obama administration, and then I was like shocked when Trump was elected. Um, and I think I went to a talk recently where someone said that, you know, we, because the Trump administration was so 
visceral in its like vilification of immigrants, right? It was like so loud and clear um, with the policies that implement they implemented and the rhetoric that was used. It felt so in your face. But the truth is the U.S. has been anti-immigrant in many ways for a long time, right? So deportations and even family separation to an extent um, was happening before Trump came in, he may have ramped it up and made it mainstream and made it so that we, we can't not look at it, um, but it was still happening. And even now with the Biden-Harris administration, like I just saw, you know, they're thinking of where they have reopened this facility for migrant children. Um, so are we, are we going back to the status quo or are we really gonna do something different with this administration? I don't know. And then with the mental health, I think when you're stressed all the time, it's like a, even if it's a passive stress, right? Like you're not, you may not be thinking about it all the time, but you have it lingering there in the back of your head. Um, it's exhausting. And um, it's exhausting to hear that you're not valued or you're not welcome or that your value and worth as a person lies in like how much you can contribute to the economy. So we see this all the time. Last year when COVID happened, um, and I think you had someone on your show who actually talked about this, like, you know, a few months ago, um, there was this thing where it was like, oh, international students will have to leave if they're taking online classes. And, you know, universities, tech companies, they came together to push back and say like, no, like, you know, we need these people. And, you know, it was great, but a lot of that argument was like the economic argument. Um, and you actually, you don't see that solidarity for other immigrant groups. And so it's like, you know, we, we're give, assigning value to people because they're more educated or because they contribute quotes more. Um, and that's, that sucks. I don't know what I say sucks, but <laughs> can I say that wrong? But you know, that's like really not great either to feel like you have to like do something, like you have to contribute, you have to be the next like Steve Jobs to be like worthy of being here and you know getting respect and um living a life of, that's like safe and where you're not stressed and i yeah. said a lot. i'm sorry <laughs> like went off no this is all such important like things to to touch upon and plus it's you know the the focus of these grad chests is of course to highlight the voices of our of our guests and i i think that is just such an important point where it's just it's objectifying it's dehumanizing where you're not looking at people as who they are as as people you're looking at them as commodities or I, I think that was the the word you used uh correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean you know there's there was even there's a and this might be a hot take because I'm in grad school but there was a thing maybe a proposal that the Biden Harris administration had said when he was running that they would give all PhD students, I might be wrong, but it was something along the lines of they'll give all PhD students like a work visa or something when they graduate. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> right. But if it doesn't go hand in hand with like documentation for people with like some, some path for people who are undocumented or who are agricultural workers or then it's still it's still inequitable right like I mean I'm a PhD student so I don't I get obviously I would love that I mean not anymore because I don't need that but like you know my colleagues but it's still not fair and the system the immigration system is very much set up that way like so for a lot of visas like a F1 visa you have to show that you can like financially pay for it so it automatically like eliminates a lot of people who can afford it so you already have kind of a higher SES group coming in not always true um, because like in grad school, a lot of times you get funding from your school. I know people whose families have like taken out loans in their home countries because you're not eligible to take out loans here. But the idea is that the system is really expensive. <laughs> like even just applying, like I just, you know, um, moved from an F1 to a green card and it was like thousands of dollars. And that doesn't include the lawyer, which you don't have to have, but like, it's always better if you do, because it's like, you know, we, my husband has an MD, I'm, I'm in, have a master's, I'm in PhD school. And like, I was still like, God, these forms are kind of complicated. Like, what do they mean by that? You know? So um, navigating the system itself is set up to be like really complicated. It favors people who speak English, who are more educated um, and who have more money. 
And so I think like if we do have any immigration reform, it has to be equitable. We can't leave out people just because they're not like bringing in um, something that we think is worth <laughs> something. Yeah, and this talk about the system also leads into this next question here that says, do you have any particular hopes that the Biden-Harris administration will do for immigration? Hope, so many hopes. <laughs> I mean, I would really like that, like something big. I don't know if it's possible, but um, definitely like just a few ideas, like pathways to residency and citizenship for people who are undocumented, not just dreamers, you know, people who are um, brought here as, as kids. Um, one thing I learned about recently, which, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't even know was if you come, like if your parents are here on work visas and you come here as a child, you can actually age out, um, which might mean that you have been living in the US since you were like three years old, you reach, you know, 18 or, or 21. Um, and then now you have to get an F1 visa, which puts you in the same category as like someone like me who spent the first 18 years of my life in India and then came here. So, you know, pathways there for people, um, definitely in terms of international students specifically. I know, I know in Canada, um, when you graduate, you can um, apply for a work permit and I think it's like three years, you, can, you know, someone can fact check me. Um, and there's a pathway to residency. So I think a pathway to residency is really important. Like for me personally, you know, it's 10 and a half years that I've been here. Um, I've worked at U US universities doing federally funded research. <laughs> um, like right now my work is with the state of Massachusetts. Like all my work, most of my work has primarily benefited communities that are in the US. And yet like the only way that I was able to transition to a resident was because I got married, <laughs> you know? And so that kind of made me feel like, do I not have worth and value through my work? That's like very much helping everyone here, but there's, there's just, there was just no path that way. Um, and I think a lot of amazing people are either not coming here. So international student admissions have been down in the last few years. They're going to other countries or they're leaving because it's a very exclusionary climate. You know, why do you want to be somewhere where no one wants you? Right. Sorry. Briefly muted, but love Sorry. Zoom. <laughs> yeah. And it it's just, I, I think it's so important to talk about these lived experiences, and these feelings, because there, there is this whole bureaucratic aspect and, and then this mental health aspect and feelings of belonging and this exhaustion that comes with it that I think is so important for people to be aware of and like it it's great that to have you here and to and to share you. your experiences with us and with that I want to shift gears a little and kind of ask you about your story so some of the questions we have here says why did you choose to study in the U.S. were you nervous about moving your whole life especially at such a young age <laughs> um yeah so so I grew up in India and going like abroad for an education was really important to my family um and to me, I grew up watching like reruns of old American TV shows, like always like maybe one year after they actually came out. Um, and so I had this idolized view. And to be honest, and this is again, maybe a hot take. <laughs> back then it felt like it was either the US or the UK. Like those are kind of the two big places. Um, and the UK has a education system that I didn't, I didn't love back then. The US has more flexibility. I could apply undeclared because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I actually applied to schools by looking at their websites. Um, um, I remember Northwestern had like a purple website and I was like, oh, this is a really nice looking website, right? There's no social media. Like maybe there was Facebook, but like no Instagram, no Snapchat, none of like, you didn't really have access to see like what people, like what it's like being there. And so I chose it because I thought, it was the best and controversial. I don't know if it is the best anymore or if it even was the best there or like movies and TV shows have just sold you the idea that, you know, of American exceptionalism. Um, I was excited. I was definitely nervous. So UCLA, um, since you're there, but 
as a grad student. They have orientation that runs for like weeks because there's so many new students. So my orientation week was in August, um, but we didn't start till like September. Um, and my parents couldn't get that much time off work. So I actually came on my own um, and there was like another family whose kid was also going. So I kind of traveled with them and I was really trying to be mature about it. Like, oh, okay, bye mom, bye dad, like at the airport. And they were gonna, they were gonna move me into the dorms in like a month. Um, but then I called my mom from the plane, like crying. And I felt so bad later because apparently she was like up all night, like waiting for me to land. Um, but I was like, why don't you come with me? Like, so yes, um, it was terrifying. Um, but I also had a lot of advantages. I, we speak English at home and I went, had an all English education. So there was no language barrier, which is huge, right? Like that's one of the main things that I think can be so isolating. Um, and I had traveled to the US before. I had binged watch like Gilmore Girls, Friends, the OC, Gossip Girl. I was like, I got this. I'm like, it's gonna be great. So, um, you know, I, and it, it, it was um, great. And I like settled in and I, there's like a couple of close friends that I'm, they're still like my closest friends that I met in the dorms <laughs> at UCLA. Um, but I don't think the university prepared me. And I, another hot take, I've been at three universities now and neither of them, I think, do a very good job of, preparing international students for what it's going to be like and maybe this is totally I don't know if this is true but maybe that's because the people who staff them are often not international students so they have an idea of what they think you need and want <laughs> um, but they've never been there so they don't actually know what you need and want you're muted <laughs> hi hi <laughs> Hello, everybody. Unmute. Welcome to welcome to virtual virtual life. Uh, hello. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. Because I think when we talk about the we talk about grad, if it could be grad school or, or whatever, whatever it is, the academics, we don't talk about the things like how hard it is to move the emotional challenges that come with moving. And it's so different for for so many people. And I think like, as someone, and I only, I moved across the country, which is also different from moving to, uh, to a different country, but it's, it's hard, right? Yeah. It, especially like I, you were just talking about getting on the plane and just feeling the emotions. And it's like, that is, that is so real. And so much part of the experience that, that challenges, if it's academics you're going for, whatever it is that you're going for. So I, it's great to just humanize this and, say that this is something that you know people should feel more comfortable talking about I know it's something that I in general didn't feel as comfortable you know talking yeah. about yeah I think it it is hard and um and I so I tweeted like a few weeks ago that you know there, there's always international orientation the sun's coming out it's like on my face um where they tell you like you know, how to maintain status, but there's always like a component of like, how to assimilate. That's not what they call it, but it's like, how to make polite conversation. You know, Americans like to talk about the weather, like, you know, always smile, shake hands, like all these things, but there's never an equivalent for the American, like domestic students for how to interact with people of other cultures. And like, that was something that, had, so I tweeted about that recently. And I was like, you know, you should have an accompanying class because we're all students of your university. So, you know, you need to tell people like some of the American students need a little tutorial <laughs> on how to interact with someone from another country because um, there's just so much, or I mean, it's maybe it's different now, but in 2010, like there was so much ignorance, <laughs> you know, and there's people saying like, making assumptions about you, assumptions about why you're here, what your background is. Um, and that can be very isolating if you're not, you know, prepared for it. You're not prepared for the fact that, um, you know, you're now racialized within the American context, right? So um, you might have just been, I'll just use my own example. Like you're just an Indian person in India, everybody's Indian, <laughs> you know, and then you come here and now you're a brown Indian person in the US context. Um, 
it's a different experience. Like you have all these stereotypes shoved on you that you don't identify with. You're grouped, like for example, you and I <laughs> are now grouped, would be grouped in an Asian category, which like if you go to Asia, it's not a category, right? Like, so it's, you know, there's all these things that I think universities could do a better job of preparing their students for, especially I would say students who come from Asian countries or countries in Africa where they're gonna be racialized in very specific ways um, when they come to the US. Yeah, it's so unwelcoming when you have this environment that won't seem to not work to make you feel welcome and make you do all the work. And yeah. that is so frustrating and so taxing. And I think it leads into this next question that, that says, if you want to elaborate a bit more on how, how do universities succeed or fail in preparing international students for the immigrant experience in the U.S.? Yeah, I think they're doing, I mean, I think they're trying. Um, and I think it's gotten a little better now as I've gone through my career from like an undergrad to now in a PhD and gone to different schools. Some schools do a better job. But I think the, the main sort of issue is a lot of the focus is on like homesickness, which, you know, obviously you get homesick. I still get homesick. <laughs> um, but I think they should be more honest with, with students about like what it's going to be like. And, you know, obviously universities are trying to sell you an education, right? Like they want you to come. <laughs> Um, so they have to strike the balance between like not scaring you off, but I think also being more realistic about, um, you know, I'm thinking of someone I know who, um, was a physician and I just for privacy sake, I'll say a country in Africa, um, you know, very successful when they came here and they said, you know, now, um, I'm an African American person and I'm seen in a certain way and I have to experience, you know, I'm experiencing racism in a way that I wasn't prepared for that they, they were a graduate student at the time. Um, and I think the university could have been better about creating spaces for that. They create a lot of spaces for like cultural groupings um, and not a lot of spaces for kind of those like hard conversations about, you know, racism. Racism is a big one, obviously, because, you know, that's what this country is built on. Um, and and this idea of being excluded and like isolation, I think. Um, because there is, you know, it's not just with the language barriers, just like you don't have the same pop culture references, you, you know, you don't have the same interest in American sports. Um, so there's all these like things that people congregate around that you may not relate to, and that can be very isolating. So then you're like, okay, either I have to start taking an interest in football, um, or I have to try to find my own niche, and it can be hard to find your own niche. Yeah, and it, it's just, it's, it's frustrating where people who benefit from the system are unwilling to put in the work to support other people and burden them with, with that, right? Right. And it, it's just, I, I think it's especially with, with the political, uh, political climate and everything that's going on, I think that's, that's always been some a, a topic but like with all the events I think it's really come to the forefront and it's something we really need to work on if yeah. you're at a place of privilege educate yourself put in some work because yeah. like any system that is going to oppress or be or treat other people unfairly benefiting from that is just so distasteful right and it's yeah it's like it's not my job to educate you <laughs> on this topic, right? And that's what happens a lot for international students. I feel like you come, you know, you come here and then like you're educating people. And some of the things I heard when I first moved here, I was like, are you joking? Like, because Google exists. So like, you can't honestly think that that's true. Um, but then it's like, you become like this cultural representative, which you also don't want to be like, I don't speak for all Indian people. My experience is it's not all Indian people. And I don't want to be a representative for, you know, the second largest country in the world. Um, but then that's what you end up like becoming in a way. Right. There are so many, so many layers <laughs> yeah. to the whole situation. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I mean, I think overarching themes is, is that there are people who need to put in more effort and there are people who need to listen. And it's because it is 
really a challenging environment to be in if you know we're talking about international student uh, experience today but like some of the experiences of people with varying identities take the time to listen to them and how the environment is impacting impacting them and one of these questions here asks you what made you decide to pursue public health and focus on immigration and mental health do you think your personal experiences help with your research yeah so so it's interesting how i moved into immigration because i have my background in clinical psychology i thought i was going to go to school for clinical psychology and be a therapist and then um you know i did some work like direct service work. And, you know, I have so much admiration for people who do that because it's really hard. Um, and I realized that, you know, it's not, it's not really a path for me. And so even when I started my PhD, I went into public health because public health, a lot of it is about like systems and structures. So, you know, you're taking a step back, you're thinking like, what policy can we implement? Um, we're thinking about populations and groups of people and how to improve their health. And so when I went in, um, I was like, okay, I've come from clinical psych, I'll go into mental health. It's a natural, natural segue. Um, and I still actually work in mental health research, like that's part of my stipend and work for the university. But, you know, in the last four years, I, so I started my PhD in 2017, you know, when, um, you know, um, the Trump administration has sort of just begun and, we had the first Muslim ban, which like I didn't think was going to last and it didn't and it expanded. And um, I was like so stressed, you know, all the time, like laying in bed, thinking about immigration so much. And I'm in like a very secure, privileged position. Like I'm in a, I was in a legal status that, you know, the PhD was like seven years. They funded, they had the, the paperwork set up for seven years of like legal status. Um, you know, I'm educated, I come from a position of relative privilege. And so I'm like, I'm so stressed all the time. I feel like I'm going to get an ulcer. What is it like for all the different identities? Like, what is it like when you're undocumented? Um, and, you know, I was started reading up about it, obviously, because I'm in grad school. And I read a few papers and I was like, wow, there's a lot of people who have been asking these exact questions and they found some like stunning effects on like your mental health and women's physical health um, as a result of you know immigration enforcement immigration policies and you know I just felt so passionately about it because I was connected to it I like switched my whole line of research like two years into my PhD which is you know pretty um like a pretty big thing to do um, but I always think if you have a personal experience to something you ask you're asking better questions. And I went to a talk recently where there was this amazing nugget of wisdom and I can't remember who said it, but it's not mine, where they said like a lot of immigration research has been through this like Western white gaze of like what you think. And we need more people to be doing the research who've been in different types of immigrant positions to be asking those questions because you have a totally different lens. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up. <laughs> In the, in the immigration research sphere. That's so cool. You're doing awesome, awesome work, by the way. <laughs> it, I'm it trying. Is, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's also really valuable to approach this topic in a research, more research-oriented perspective and present things that way and investigate, ask those questions, because I think it, oftentimes people for some reason respond more to that I mean I'm not saying that like either yeah no no it's true yeah it, it's just it's a perspective especially when you're talking to scientists and you talk about data and, and methods and all that it's it's another way of presenting this topic that one I, I maybe gets through to people you can you can put it that way and two just gives a nice organized evidence-based approach for sharing some of these still very real real struggles that are happening and just is is another another way to present right that story even though it shouldn't be necessary to you know play around with how you present things but it is a unique way to approach the discussion yeah, I agree it shouldn't be necessary but you know when you tell someone that after an immigration like after ICE does a big immigration raid you see a, a increase in the number of 
preterm babies, like our babies born too early or after the Muslim ban happened, there was a recent study that said that there was like a increase in the number of preterm babies born to women who were, um, who were born in those countries who lived here. Or if you say like, look, they're undocumented people like, you know, stopped using, like didn't go to get their health care as much anymore. Once you, I started cooperating with local police enforcement, here's the data, here are the numbers, here are the stories. It's sad, but people listen more. They're like, okay, well now you, there's evidence, right? Everybody wants evidence, even of things that we know to be true, but you have to show the evidence. So you can say, look, there's 50 papers on this. Can we now <laughs> accept that this is a thing? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's frustrating to need to be strategic, but sometimes it's, it's something that gets through to people it's, and documentation convinces people. And it, it's, it's convincing to see plots. So it, it's all, there's so many, there's so many things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I've answered every question with like five other <laughs> different trains of thought. No, and it, it's, I think it's what these grad chats are for, just getting at so many layers of mm -hmm. different stories, how everyone can go through varying challenges, even, you know, we talked about under the international student status, it's, it's a whole spectrum of different types of right. experiences. And there's so many things to talk about. Right. And with that, we are running out of time for this grad chat. But Samir, if there's anything in addition that you want to just leave our audience with or anything that we didn't cover, uh, anything that comes um, to mind for you? Just that that Im immigrants are a very heterogeneous group, you know, different statuses, different backgrounds, even international students. Um, so just for us to always remember that and not to, you know, box everyone into into just one box because we have the immigrant label. No I think that's a great, <laughs> yeah, that's a great message. Just, you know, listen, take the time to listen to everyone's story and challenges. And there's always going to be stereotypes. There's always going to be assumptions that exist, but please take the time to listen to yeah. everyone. And this has been so great. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for having me. Yeah, Samir, it's been amazing talking to you if you are tuning in for the first time this is grad chat from phc balance where we talk to so many different people about so many things about not research <laughs> if you liked what you see saw here don't forget to subscribe so you can get notifications about when we go live which is every saturday 12 p.m pacific 3 p.m eastern and until then we will see you next time bye bye everyone